QPL's annual It's Time for Kind initiative is a seasonal celebration of the big and small acts of generosity that can turn a whole day around. Attend programs for all ages that promote kindness, contribute to our annual canned food drive, share your kindness story on our kindness walls, and more. Visit queenslib.org forward slash it's time for kind to learn more. For 45 years, Queen's Public Library's New Americans program has proudly celebrated our borough's outstanding diversity, while also supporting newcomers as they adjust to life in the United States. Join us as we honor the New Americans program's 45th anniversary with a variety of educational and cultural programs. View the full schedule on our calendar at queenslibrary.org. Queen's Name Explorer is a year-long project to uncover the stories behind Queen's named streets, schools, buildings, parks, and monuments. Local and volunteer historians, you can help. To learn more and contribute information, an image, or a video, visit queenslib.org forward slash explore. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's Talk with Damian Lewis, author of Agent Josephine, American Beauty, French Hero, British Spy. The New Yorker writes, Damian Lewis chronicles Josephine Baker with much fresh detail. What most beguiles us today is the sense that a proud revolutionary lurked beneath the winsome savage, the snowy smile. Spycraft wasn't so much what Baker did as who she was. The Wall Street Journal proclaims, Mr. Lewis is a prolific author of wartime histories and novels. Agent Josephine is a fascinating story, thoroughly researched and richly detailed, written in the breathless style of a thriller. Jean-Pierre Reggiore, Josephine Baker's dance partner, says of Lewis's book, fascinating and riveting. What a story. It has never been told properly, if ever, before now. I know Josephine would be very proud of how she is portrayed. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Hank, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, and I've recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions. I also co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press. My first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Mary A. Media in 2011 and is streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performing on Grata, will be released in April 2023 by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its ninth year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Damian Lewis is an award-winning writer who spent 20 years reporting from war, disaster, and conflict zones for the BBC and other global news organizations. He's the best-selling author of more than 20 books, many of which are being adapted into films or television series, including military history, thrillers, and several acclaimed memoirs about military working dogs. Lewis lives in Dorchester, England. Thank you for joining us so much, uh, Damian, this evening. I know it's very late in London. Thank you very much. Great to be with you guys. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's our pleasure, in fact. Um, so let's start with a quote by Ernest Hemingway. He says that he once called Josephine Baker the most sensational woman anyone has ever seen or ever will see. For those who somehow don't know, <laughs> please briefly tell us a bit about Josephine Baker, her talent, her career, and her celebrity. Yeah, so Josephine uh, was born in St. Louis um, and grew up in poverty, um, you know, stealing coal from the streetcars with a with a street gang going to school barefoot um a really really tough up a tough childhood and josephine at kind of age 13 decided 
found out, realized that she had this incredible, amazing talent as a singer and, and a dancer. And she just did so kind of on the streets of St. Louis. And through that, she had this kind of like epiphany moment where she thought maybe, just maybe she could attempt to make her living um, by singing and dancing on the stage. And so she pretty much ran away from home and tried to find her way to Broadway, understanding that that was the the one place where you could try and make it on the stage. And, you know, through hard work and graft, she got there when she was 15, 16 and won a part on the Broadway stage. Um, and she was successful. But over the next two or three years, she realized that as a black female performer in the States back then, which was obviously at the time the Jim Crow laws and segregation, mm -hmm. she was never going to be the person she could be. She was never going to achieve what she believed she could achieve. And so when she was 19, she was approached by an impresario, a, 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 a theater and show manager who basically invited her to be the lead role in a new Paris uh, theater musical that they were putting on called the Revue Negra. And, you know, Josephine took a heart in her hands, very daunting, this idea of leaving the state. She'd never obviously left America before. And she decided to set sail from New York to Paris. And what and year was that, Damien? I'm sorry. Around that, was about, that was about 15 years prior to the war, prior to the outbreak of the war. Okay. Um, she was 19 <clears throat> years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so she sailed on this liner for Paris, hoping that what she'd heard about Europe and that Europe was relatively free of prejudice and segregation would prove to be true. And she arrived there um, and found, you know, her first experiences in, in, in Paris and then across France and wider Europe, utterly revolutionary and refreshing. You know, she realized that perhaps here she could be free and, and, and achieve all she wants to achieve. And that show, the Revue Negra, was uh, extremely provocative. Uh, it, 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 it won either rave reviews or got absolutely condemned. Mm. Um, but Jose it catapulted Josephine into stardom. So very quickly, you know, by the time she was 2021, 20, she was becoming basically this superstar, this really first global true superstar, yeah. uh, you know, not just in, in France, but across the capitals of Europe. So we're talking sure. London, Paris, Rome, Amsterdam. And, you know, she very quickly became one of the most uh, successful singers and dancers, but also one of the most wealthy and also photographed women in the world. Prior to the war, she was the most photographed woman in the world. Um, and, and, in, and indeed, she performed in, in Berlin, in Germany, to rapturous receptions in Germany in the early 30s. And so, you know, her, her kind of reception and, and, and her dream of making it uh, was really came alive in, in Europe. And to such an extent, that she she you know, had a song composed for her, Je Dis Amour, I Have Two Loves. And the two loves she spoke of were one, Paris and France, and the two, America, mm. uh, the land of her birth. Interesting, really interesting. And and amidst all of this incredible celebrity <laughs> and, and astronomically high profile, she was a spy, um, which I think a lot of people did not necessarily know about. I want to hear from you about how you decided to First of all, research and write this book. And also, please talk to us a little bit about how your family's French chateau figures into the story. I remember <laughs> reading about that a bit in the beginning of the book. I remember, you know, you told me about the interview process before we went on. You mentioned that it was a true investigation, parsing different versions of the story, the truth from lies and fantasy. Please talk to us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so I, I first kind of ran into or came across Josephine's story as a spy. Obviously, I knew about her beforehand as a performer um, about 10 years ago. And it was just a very brief mention somewhere in the press that Josephine had been a spy during the Second World War. And it just struck me as being impossible. I mean, how could somebody of such high profile, such instant recognizability have served as an agent of the shadows? Mm -hmm. And it piqued my interest. And then a while, and I started to build up a research file, as one does. And then... A, a, a year or two years after that, my father, who lives in France and had sold 20 years ago our, our modest home in, the, in Britain and bought a completely derelict 14th century French chateau with cattle living in the ground floor and spent the next 10 years renovating it. He happened to pay a visit to Josephine Baker's chateau, Chateau des Milondes in the Dordogne, where she had lived when she was not in Paris prior to the war. And he'd gone there to look at the chateau because, you know, these were things that, you know, really resonated with him. But what he'd found there 
was a living memorial, which is the Chate what Chateau de Milan is today, to Josephine Baker's life and work, including her work as a French, as, as a spy for the Allies. There's a whole wing of the Chateau, which is the resistance wing. Right. And so he called me about it and said, listen, there's this amazing story about Josephine Baker. Do you know about it? And I said, yeah, I, I've been researching it for like two or three years and it's it's utterly gripping. And he said, well, you have to come. You have to come and see it. So I traveled to the Chateau um, and that really catapulted me into the journey of, of, of writing the book. However, um, you know, it was as much a journey of detective work mm. as it was of being a historian, because, you know, thankfully, the United States and Great Britain were not occupied by Nazi Germany. Um, France was so much of Western Europe was sure. Um, so much of the world was, of course. And, you know, the occupation of France was brutal and long and it set brother against brother, father against son, you know, husband against wife, village against village. And, you know, resistance fighter against collaborator against everything in between. And those scars run very deep. Yeah. And even to this day, and for those reasons, people have written and told versions of what happened in the Second World War with their own kind of vested interests written in, into that, relating back to what they actually did in the war. Right, and so right. when, when I was researching this story, that was the first kind of filter of truth. One had to try and put everything through from what perspective and with what agenda has this person written this material or filed this report? And then over and above that, the next layer of kind of secrecy was that these were secret agents. You know, yeah. Josephine's work was top secret. She worked right. first for the French intelligence services, but then, of course, for the British intelligence services. Right. And then, of course, later in the war for the American intelligence services. Right. So she was right. working for three foremost nations of the Allies Incredible. doing the most the utmost secret work, some of which changed the course of World War Two. Absolutely. This was top secret stuff. And so, you know, there is an expectation that you do not speak about that kind of work, you know, for decades after your life. And most agents, as you know, go to the grave without having spoken mm. about it. And Josephine pretty much never spoke about the specifics of what she did in the war. She spoke about the pride she had in the war and what she'd done there. After the war, it was always the thing if a journalist asked her, what are you most proud of with your life and work? She would always say the war years but she never really spoke about the specifics. So that was the next kind of layer of, of kind of, you know, um, smoke screen around the story was that, that this was all very secret work. And then the right. third layer, which kind of made it even more complex in sifting the story was that some of what Josephine and her colleagues in the French intelligence service in particular did in the second world war was fine during a time of war, because in a time of war, when you're fighting the, th the threat of Nazi Germany, you know, they took the decision, and I believe rightly so, that they would they would work with anyone. They'd work with the devil himself hmm. if it meant they could defeat a greater evil. Sure. But some of the things they did were right on the boundaries and the cusp of what is legal and acceptable, you know, working with assassins and forgers and the mafia. And all these, these yeah. people, these these very, very, very dodgy individuals to to defeat a greater threat. You know, bad boys made good in the Allied cause. All of that was fine in a time of war. But when the war was over and peace returned, could you really write about and tell those true stories? And, you know, mm. what would then be the comeback on you if you did? So, yeah, all of that was was uh, an interesting challenge. And 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 uh, an incredibly arduous one. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, research included, it's been a, it's been a 10 year project. I a mean, full 11 decade. actually, yep. you know, 11 years. over a decade. And um, yeah, it was one of those journeys where there were so many twists and turns on the way. And I was just saying to you earlier, you know, I had these moments, you know, every book is a journey. It's a very special journey. And there are moments of serendipity when things happen and it's like this you you, you know this, this this epiphany moment i had several people approach me from out of the blue who were absolutely seminal to josephine's story and say hey i've heard you're writing this book or researching this book and i had x this is my story this is how i knew josephine hmm. would you like to talk would you like to see the archive and and in each of those situations that was absolute gold dust i'd like to get into some of the specifics that you chronicle in your book um regarding italy uh, Josephine had a great love affair with Italy, and she had initially endorsed Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. 
Can you talk to us about that and also how she felt afterward when she learned that Mussolini had misled her? Yes, yeah, so Josephine toured Italy and, you know, as a, as a singer and a performer. And she mm -hmm. she kind of was was she was she was awed and seduced, not physically, but, into you know, uh, by his by Mussolini's character, you know, this mm -hmm. strong man. And he sold her this lie, which is that his his mission in, in terms of, you know, his leadership of Italy was to emancipate those still enslaved under, under colonialism. And of course, it was a pack of lies because when Italy sure. invaded East Africa, they became the new colonialists. This was not mm -hmm. a war of liberation. But right. initially, Josephine kind of backed him and believed it. And of course, when she realized that she'd backed the wrong horse and that Mussolini was using chemical weapons, mustard gas against the Ethiopians, mm -hmm. among other terrible things, you know, this was um, this was uh, an awful realization for her. But the really interesting thing is that you know, it kind of came good in the end because her first ever espionage assignment, which was given by the French intelligence service, you know, to kind of test her out. And this is prior to the war even breaking out, was to find out what the intention of Italy would be should Germany declare war. Would Italy join Nazi Germany in the war? It was something the Allied powers really needed to know. And Josephine used that connection that she had, that in she had with the with the Italian embassy embassy in Paris, where she was, of course, fetid because she was seen as being a friend of Mussolini. And she managed to, again, seduce to whether physically or just intellectually, it, it's unclear, but she seduced the military attaché, the Italian military attaché at the embassy, and she found out chapter and verse about what Italy intended. So within a week of being set, set that first task, she was able to deliver that intelligence to her intelligence handler in the French intelligence services. And of course, it was like it was it was an incredible moment because they realized that he was an agent who really, really could deliver. This was her first mission, right? Yeah. Damien? And so backtracking a moment, how did she become an honorable correspondent for France? What, yeah, what was... so, so 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 kind of just. Just prior to the war, the the um, state of French and British intelligence was woeful. What do I mean by that? Well, after the First World War, the millions of dead, you know, so many years of horrific trench warfare, no one believed there would ever be another Europe, war in Europe. People believed it was basically impossible. And so the intelligence services were, were woefully run down, underfunded and understaffed, hugely understaffed. And so in the run up to the war, the British and French intelligence services knew, were convinced that should Nazi Germany invade, France would fall. OK, and they tried warning their political taskmasters to no avail. So the other great fear was the lack of agents, just a lack of personnel to counter the mass of enemy agents that the German intelligence service, the Abwa, were sending into France and other nations in Europe. They were flooding these countries with their agents. And so the French intelligence service were desperate, desperately undermanned and desperate. And so they turned to what is a tried and tested method of using what are basically freelance voluntary spies that they're, they're, they're termed honorable correspondents. So these are individuals, you know, who because of their work or their family background or their career, there is a reason that they will make good agents. They can travel, they can ask questions, they can move in those kind of circles. So, for example, journalists make great honorable correspondence because that's exactly what we do. We travel, we ask difficult questions, we take notes. So do industrialists. But so, too, do theatrical agents of all types because they also travel and they move in high circles. And so at some stage prior to the war, months prior to the war, the idea was mooted at the Dizien Bureau, the French counter espionage service, that Josephine Baker should be approached. It was not a popular suggestion. It wasn't popular, one, because back in that day, wrongly, um, you know, intelligence agents were mostly men and they thought women did not make good intelligence agents. Hmm. But more hmm. importantly, and I, I kind of paraphrase, but this is basically what they said. They believed that Josephine would be one of those fragile superstars who would shatter like glass at the first hint of any danger. Hmm. So they didn't believe she had the steel within her to to pull this off. Um, but Colonel Pel Paul Pelol, who was the head of the Dizian Bureau, insisted and he sent one of his agents, a long standing Dizian Bureau agent called Jacques Abte. I was just going to ask Jose you about Jacques. Yeah. To Josephine's uh, chateau in um, in Paris, on the outskirts of Paris, the, the Beauchene. 
and he sent Jacques Abte there to sound her out. Abte went very reluctantly with few hopes, and he expected when he turned up at, at, at Josephine's Gates to see the archetype of Josephine Baker as she was, you know, portrayed in the media and on stage, which was, you know, in a very revealing ball gown, glittering in jewels, maybe with a pet cheetah chiquita on its diamond studded leash this flamboyant glamorous superstar that's what he was expecting and he turned up there and drove through the gates and there was a cry from the bushes from her garden and he looked over and there was this figure in a battered felt cap old kind of <laughs> stained gardening clothes with a rusty tin can full of snails in her hands it was Josephine <laughs> baker completely the opposite of what he was sure. expecting that's great. Can you tell us? I'm gonna. I don't want to butcher the name. France's Counter Espionage Service. How do you pronounce it? It's the the Dizian Bureau. Dizian Bureau. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the Dizian Bureau. Uh, you spoke about Jacques Abte, and also, did they? What What made Abte recruit Baker, and why did the bureau think that she would be a good spy? So the Dizian Bureau was the French counter espionage service. What the counter espionage service do is it's their job to stop other nations spying in your country. Yeah. So they track down the spies of enemy nations and mm -hmm. deal with them. That's largely what they're and they penetrate the enemy's own um, espionage network. So the Dizian Bureau, their key enemy was the Abwa, the German intelligence service. And so their their, their key objective was to stop their agents operating in France, but also to penetrate mm -hmm. their networks in Germany via mm -hmm. double agents. That was the Dizian Bureau's business. And um, Abte, Abte uh, Baker's partner, and she were falling in love, but they were both still married. There was, a, there was a, a great romance between them. Is that right? Yeah. So when Abte went to Josephine's chateau, of course, um, you know, he as I say, he had very few hopes that she would be suitable. And, um, you know, she took him into the in, into the library of the chateau, her favorite room. Uh, fire was blazing away, sh sh served champagne by the butler. And this is when it becomes really interesting because he sat down, you know, one either side of the fireplace and he suddenly treated to something that Jean-Pierre Reggiori, who you mentioned earlier, yeah. who was Josephine Baker's dance partner. Right. Hugely yeah. helpful in, in writing the book. And he described it to me. It was the Josephine Baker effect. It was this unique ability she had. This is why she was such a superstar to reach out from the stage and to touch individually and connect with every member of her audience by mm. making him or her feel as if she was singing and dancing specifically for them. It's this magnetic wow. kind of superstar appeal that she had and very few individuals can do it or had it sure. and Josephine had it in spadefuls and mm -hmm. suddenly Jacques Abte was sat opposite her in the fireplace being treated to the Josephine effect up close and personal and he realized very quickly that if they could if they could harness that to the world of spying she would be unbeatable because who could she not uh, subvert and, and and seduce by That's by the Josephine sure. effect sure and and so of course there came a moment when he had to when he had to pop the question to Josephine and say you know, what's the effect? You know, I, I guess you know why I'm here. Uh, you know, I'm here to see if you'll spy for France. And at that moment, she said, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it was words to the effect. France has given me everything I have. Paris has made me who I am. I'm willing to give this country and the cause of my life. Gosh, and, and she sure that, did. Yeah. Yeah. And it was at that moment that Abte um, gave her that first mission that I described, the mission to find out what the Italian intentions would be in the war with which, you know, a week later she delivered. During the 1940 uh, Blitzkrieg, as Germany took control of France in only, what was it, 38 days, um, what did Baker do and where did she go? So the fall of France was um, precipitate. It was unimaginable. You know, the Dissembure and the British Secret Intelligence Service were, you know, were, were certain that France would fall, but no one saw it falling that quickly yeah. and that catastrophically and of course when 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 uh, german forces took paris they marched in unopposed because nobody wanted france to be destroyed by by, by bombing and, and by artillery barrages and so josephine was forced to flee paris on roads choked with refugees and being bombed by enemy aircraft heading south to her chateau a chateau des melons in in the dordogne 
um, and she 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 retreated to Milan with this kind of like cadre of you know Jewish refugees, the odd intelligence renegade intelligence agent, um, some some former French military personnel, and their what what glued them together, the gel that held them together was their their collective desire to resist and to fight, and so they they kind of gathered at Chateau de Melon. They formed they formed this you know makeshift resistance crew, but no one knew how to resist. You know, mm. we're talking June, July, August 1940. No one knew how to resist. No one even knew if there would be a resistance in France. Sure, yeah. Because, of course, France was taken. You know, there was an amistice with Nazi Germany. And, you know, uh, that was supposed to be the end at the end of, 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 of the fight. And so they sat there wondering what on earth they were to do. And then uh, in, in June 1940, General Charles de Gaulle, the free French leader who'd, who'd, who'd gone to London and set up the free French to resist gave mm -hmm. his historic um, radio a call over the BBC, urging the French people to rise up and fight. And they heard that at the Chateau de Milan, and, and that was the first thing that they responded to. And then very quickly thereafter, a few days later, Churchill, in his reasonably decent French, gave his call to arms. And those two things kind of galvanised them and gave them the spirit to explore how they might fight. And so during this period when when Germany was had seized Paris and was spreading into the rest of the country and to the rest of France, what did Baker the spy and Baker the performer do during this initial period? Well, Josephine had been identified as an enemy of the of, of the Nazi state mm -hmm. even before the war. So she shows Joseph Goebbels, Goebbels, the mm -hmm. uh, the the Nazi Germany's propaganda minister, propaganda, you know. Right very very clever propagandist mm -hmm. he had printed leaflets pamphlets with josephine on the front cover kind of like epitomizing uh you know all that she stood for as enemies of the nazi state so she was known and identified as as an enemy of nazi germany and indeed let's be frank about it josephine had made no bones about her diehard opposition to nazism oh yeah and you know and, and lots of people have asked me well you know josephine was an american citizen you know why did she do what most americans did and go to the american embassy in paris ask for her visa and her papers and just travel back to america to safety which she would have had every right to do as an american citizen but in a sense josephine was never going to take a backward step like that sure. i mean you know she she was brought up in, in in adversity and she was an absolute street fighter she really was and she was unbreakable and in josephine's mind you can imagine she had struggled for so long to even have the chance to make it and be who she could be and she'd found it in france and in europe and suddenly she saw the rise of nazi germany and the threat and the danger that all those freedoms that she cherished all those freedoms that we all cherish, that all democratic people of the world cherish, were about to be taken away from her. Because don't forget, Nazi Germany was about taking over the world under Nazism, not just Europe. You know, Once Europe had fallen, it was going to be South America, North America, and Africa, the world under the Third Reich. And if, if, if they won, if they triumphed, where could any freedom loving peoples retreat to Josephine Baker included? So she right. really had no option in her own mind but to fight. The question was, how to do so and so what did they do at the Chateau de Mall? Well, they gathered weaponry they tried to gather intelligence the French intelligence service hadn't ceased to function it had gone underground if that makes sense so yeah. in occupied France and in Vichy France the free half of France well free as much as it was French intelligence agents were still active but they were gathering intelligence against Nazi Germany secretly and of course they had no way to get any of that intelligence to Britain who at that stage was the only dog in the fight after the fall of Western Europe. And so Josephine gathered weapons, she gathered a resistance crew, that they, they gathered intelligence, but they had no means to do anything with this. And actually, even those initial forays into the world of resistance almost were the, you know, were the end of Josephine, because very, very quickly, that summer of 1940, a, uh, a colonel of the Gestapo, turns up at Josephine's chateau um yeah and and it's a it's a terrifying moment you know for all who are gathered there in fact she's actually yeah. got two dizzy and bureau agents in the library with her who've yeah. turned up with weaponry and intelligence and she tells them orders them to go and hide as the colonel is coming up the stairs in his jack boots to interrogate her and he comes in and he says you know 
you have been denounced, which means, you know, someone has gone to the Gestapo and, and, and reported Josephine for all the things she's been doing. And of course, he's expecting, you know, what you would anticipate from someone who was guilty and fearful, fear, guilt, apologies, um, you know, all those things to show in her demeanor and what she says, he gets completely the opposite. And this is where Josephine's ability as an actress you know, because, of course, she was a movie star as well, Is was absolutely to the fore. She treats him with icy dismissal and disdain, and he can't believe it. He's thinking in his mind, well, if this was true, if this denouncement was true, how could she be acting like this? I'll give you an example of what happens. Eventually, he says, she, she says, why have you come? And he says, well, you've been denounced. And, he say, and she says to him, what is worse, to believe the denouncer or to suspect the person who, who's been denounced of doing what they've said. How dare you come in here and make these accusations against me? Mm. And eventually he says to her, look, could we just sit down and have a cup of coffee? And she <laughs> says, I would gladly offer you a cup of coffee, but there is none left in France anymore, mm. because since Germany, your, your illegal invasion, we don't have yeah. any coffee anymore. Yeah. If wow. you go home and you come to my country in peace, I will glad you offer, offer you coffee, but not now. Mm. And the, the colonel is so... So blown away by her poise and her, 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 her arrogance and a dismissal of him that he leaves without even carrying out a proper search of the chateau and, of course, finding all the damning evidence that was amazing. there. So, yeah, really it's an amazing. incredible story. And I was actually just going to ask you about that, Damien, because I know in your book you, you, you go into how on several occasions people, refugees, resistance fighters, even Nazis, showed up at Baker's Chateau Malone. Um, and I was going to ask you to tell us about this particular episode. So you actually had a psychic moment and you got there before <laughs> I could ask it. <laughs> tell us a bit about Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale um, and his relationship with Ian Fleming. Of course, he would become the model, right, for James Bond yeah. and how he would come to be um, and how he would, he and Baker would sort of have this, share a story on some level. Yeah, so uh, Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale was the, uh, the, the the secret intelligence services, so the British secret intelligence service spy master in Paris. Mm -hmm. He is to this day a legendary figure within British spying circles to such an extent that at the training base for spies in Britain for the secret intelligence service, they have a mess where you go and have formal dinners and a big, long, polished table in the middle of the mess. A mm -hmm. silver bowl sits in pride of place in the mess and it's Dunderdale's engraved silver bowl. Wow. So, and, and even then, you know, in the run up to the war, he was still, he was this iconic standout spy master. And prior to the war, he was instrumental in Josephine, in Josephine's kind of shaping training as, as, as an honorary correspondent, but more, in the plan they put together as to what should be done if France fell to keep the intelligence flowing to um, to Britain, because that was the big challenge. And indeed, once once France fell and once, you know, British and, and allied troops were evacuated from the from the beaches at Dunkirk, Churchill said to his spy chiefs, France has gone dark. We have not a single agent or a single source there anymore. You must get intelligence flowing from France. And Dunderdale had foreseen this. And so it, during the war, he would work very closely with Josephine Baker and Jacques Abde. He became their spy master. He was also a, 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 an aficionado and close friend of Ian Fleming, of course, mm -hmm. who wrote the, the James Bond novels. Right. And James Bond himself is based in, to a very large degree, on Wilfred Dunderdale, who was this debonair. He had the right. cigarette holder, the, mm -hmm. the champagne, very good looking, very debonair, born with independent means. Incidentally, his nickname, Biffy. He it, it sounds like a bizarre nickname, but he had it because it, the word Biff was to punch and he used to he was a very yeah. good boxer uh, oh. when he was at uni school and university. So he was like this kind of he really was a kind of photo fit for the for the uh, James Bond as, as Fleming created it. But as for Jacques Capte and Josephine, Dundale would play a seminal role in their earliest and actually, I would argue, their most important spying missions. Something that really struck me about uh, your your biography here is that. Baker flew her own planes on spying missions. Is that right? That's incredible. Yeah. So, so just before the uh, just before the war, nineteen thirty-seven, Josephine Baker married um, Jean Lyon, and Jean Lyon was a was a, a Jewish industrialist, and, and and they had this very high profile, high society wedding, as you can imagine, uh, and and they were in love, and you know they they tried to have children, and then war broke out, and and the relationship floundered, but 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 before all of that. Jean Lyon, who was a pilot, 
taught Josephine to fly and she earned her pilot's license. In fact, Jean Lyon proposed to Josephine, asked her to marry him when they were when they were in the air, when they were flying. And mm -hmm. so when when war was declared and during the we call it the phony war, but you know, for those for those persecuted in Germany and Austria, for the Jews and 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 and, and the communists and and all those enemies of the Nazi state, you know, it was it wasn't a phony war. You know, tens sure. of thousands of them were were suffering horrendous, you know, incarceration in the concentration camps, and 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 and, and many more were fleeing into the free countries of Western Europe. And so, Josephine used her aircraft, this little light aircraft that she had, to fly her own missions of mercy. So she was flying in aid to those refugees in, in the low countries, in Belgium, in Holland, in those countries. Right. But at the same time, of course, you know, she was she, she was actually, she had a cover, so she was actually officially flying missions for the French equivalent of the Red Cross. And so mm. she had a reason to fly these, fly these routes where she could actually take observations and spy upon the enemy's positions from the air. So that was the kind of like the dual clandestine role she carried out before uh, Nazi Germany invaded France. The story is so cinematic, uh, Damien. It begs the question, and I don't know if you can tell us yet or not, Is it? are there plans to have it adapted into a film or a TV series? Yeah, so the, 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 <clears throat> we, we really hope that's going to happen. I mean, um, Janelle Monet, uh, who you will know, is... is yeah. uh, it, yeah. it, it's scheduled to play Josephine, and uh, you know it should be a, a streaming series. That's the idea behind concentrating purely on her war years and telling, oh, of course, great. this um, you know the story of how this most incredible, incredibly high-profile superstar somehow served as agent in the shadows. That's great. Janelle Monet is actually a great choice because she's beautiful and she's charismatic and she could sing and she's a great actor. So really, I think she would do Baker justice. How many missions did Baker participate in and what would you say was the most challenging? Well, she she, she participated in dozens and dozens. Um, and the fascinating thing about um, Josephine's journey as a spy, you know, initially she is, um, you know, she's handled by Jacques Abde, her her intelligence, her, her spy, her espionage partner, but a long-standing Desi Bureau agent with huge experience. And Jacques Abbe has these worries that she will actually make it as a spy because she's she's very kind of like feisty and, and, and explosive in her character. And he makes these comments, can I control her? Can I train her? Can I shape her to be an agent? And it's one of the things I love about the story that drew me in is that, so she goes from being the rookie agent and the student and very quickly, Within the space of about eighteen months, she becomes the agent, at, at you know the, 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 the student almost becomes the master. And the mm -hmm. reason, one of the main reasons for that happening is that Jacques Abde can't travel anywhere because he doesn't have the cover of mm -hmm. the superstar who can travel to any of sure. these neutral countries, sure. for example, sure. performing. And so he actually is he's prevented from carrying his mission. So Josephine has to has to carry out a lot of these espionage operations solo on her own. But in terms of the most important and the most challenging, I'd say it's probably the first of, of, of that they actually carry out um, after the fall of France. So what happens is, you know, London, Britain is hungry for intelligence out of France. And so Paul Pellol, Colonel Paul Pellol, the head of the Deuxième Bureau, now the head of the underground French intelligence service, sends Jacques Abte to Josephine Chateau. And Abte turns up there with all of the intelligence everything gathered by the French underground intelligence service since June 1940 in the fall of France through to September, October 1940. This is a trove of intelligence. It's everything from, you know, uh, the, the, the names of the German agents dispatched to, 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 to the UK, to the locations of the Luftwaffe, the German mm -hmm. uh, Air Force air bases flying the Battle of Britain and the Blitz over the UK, uh, the, the details of the invasion plan to invade Gibraltar. This is war winning intelligence and Abte turns up at Josephine Chateau and says this is the plan mm -hmm. we need to get this intelligence to the UK mm -hmm. the only person we can think can do so who can travel and carry all this intelligence is you why you because you arguably can go to somewhere like Lisbon the neutral capital of Portugal you can actually genuinely put on some bona fide shows there that's your cover mm -hmm. you travel to shows with voluminous tour trunks, stuff full of your costumes, but also your your musical sheets, 
your songs. I can transcribe a lot of this intelligence with invisible ink on the score sheets and we can hide it that way. But some of it has to go as raw intelligence. I'll give you an example. The photographs of the invasion crafts the Germans were building to invade Great Britain, for example. And they said, but we can hide that in your tour trunks. And Josephine says, yes, of course. When do we go? And so they set off on this absolutely incredible, extraordinary journey from France to the Spanish border, across the Spanish border to Madrid, then boarding an aircraft and flying into Portugal through this Portuguese border to try and deliver this intelligence to the secret intelligence service cell based at the British embassy in Portugal. And, and the most extraordinary thing about that journey is that, and it, I'll de describe the scene, it's easier to talk about it. So they turn up at that first checkpoint at the French Spanish border in, in the Pyrenees mountains mm -hmm. and they turn <clears> and they get off the train and, and, and there's all these mat, the voluminous tour luggage and it's Josephine and Jack and Josephine gets down dressed to kill mm. in her finest furs and her most incredibly, um, you know, ostentatious jewelry. And she's doing it deliberately. She is the sure. actress. She's on the stage. Only this time she's performing not just for her life and Jacques Abde's life, but you could argue for the fortunes of the Allies because that mm. intelligence in her tour trunks is war winning material. Sure. And she breezes along that platform. And the most incredible thing is the <laughs> you know the Gestapo agents, the culture, the, the the customs, uh, the customs officers, all those individuals who were charged, whose job it is to search her, to ask for a passport, to ask those testing questions, to search her luggage, instead are starstruck by the power of celebrity, <laughs> and they is... call their girlfriends and their wives to come and have a photograph of Josephine Baker, and all the way through all those checkpoints on that journey, she does exactly the same, and she is hiding in plain sight yes. she's using her yes. stardom as her cloak and her dagger yes and it's really extraordinary how she does that and that answers my question your question how did she do this being such a high profile superstar yeah yeah it, and and i think that is sort of the core of, of of your book and and this sort of incredibly uh fascinating and bewitching enigmatic uh figure who was able to to do this incredible several year um world changing sleight of hand <laughs> on some level. Um, Damien, I want to look at some of the photos that you had sent us. So if so if you could just sort of narrate as we go through them briefly. Yeah, so that's obviously Josephine, um, mm -hmm. you know, prior to the war in at the height of her performing days. And, you know, this this image, um, it's not it's not Chiquita the cheater, obviously, but she did go on stage with Chiquita many, many times. Mm -hmm. Josephine had been brought up in St. Louis, as I said, but she always had animals at home. She was a lover of animals from the day she was born. To such an extent, her mother used to get really annoyed with her because she'd bring home all the strays to the house. <laughs> and she did the same on the stage. She wow. she filled her stage with exotic animals. And this you'll love this. She she was so smart that she mm. realised. You know, I said played, hiding in plain sight, the uh, mm -hmm. stardom, her cloak and dagger. She realised that when she had to carry out some of the most daring espionage missions of her life that if she traveled with a menagerie of exotic animals no one in their right mind would ever ever dream she could possibly be a spy so there's one moment she has to get on a ship and travel from from marseille to um, north africa to casablanca and she right. does it with all of her exotic menagerie of animals, snakes <laughs> white mice bonzo the great dane and of course oh no gosh. one ever suspects her of course. Wow, that's 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 beautiful, actually. How about this one? So Josephine at a, a diplomatic function, and this is her in her milieu. This is where Josephine gathered her intelligence and worked her magic, and mm. did so in such a way that those people that she um, she was inveigling into her confidence has never realised. I mean, you know, she she used to say that she would, you know, twirl on the dance floor with a flute of champagne, hmm. dazzling and smiling. And then she would re she would retire to the loo and write the intelligence she gathered, scribble it on her arms. and her Yes. Hands. Yeah, I remember that from your book. I was going to actually ask you about that. I'm glad you brought it up. How about this one? So that's Josephine performing to the um, to the injured uh, in North Africa. Uh, so that would be 19, late 1943, early 1944. She's, so, she spent some time in Casablanca, right? Marrakesh, yeah, so Marrakesh, right? All over North Africa. Yeah. So, 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 
after the, uh, the, 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 the 1942 torch, Operation Torch Landings, where American and British troops land in North Africa, first major amphibious operation of the war. After that, Josephine kind of like combines her espionage role with this role, which is, um, you know, performing for the troops. It's a morale boosting role. Fearless, on the mm. front line, under fire, in the desert, and and always making a point of going to perform to the wounded, mm. um, as that as that picture shows, with the most remarkable and heartrending effect. She really was. You know, she was such a, a hit, such a success that the American military tried to get her to sign a contract to perform for the American military all through the West of the war exclusively. And she refused because she said, I will perform for American troops. Of course, I will. But I'll also perform for the British, the French, the Belgians, the Czechs, whoever they may be, because I have to perform for all, all, all those fighting the Nazi threat. Such an admirable position. And then the Chateau, right? Chateau de Melon, um, mm -hmm. and and in one of these towers in the Dordogne, and in one of this is where Josephine had a makeshift shift resistance crew, and in one of those towers they hid their radio transmitter set with which they could actually make contact with London, and in the cellars, of course, they had all the weaponry that they were gathering to you know form a resistance cell um, secreted there. This is where the colonel that I described came to confront right. Josephine right. and she refused to serve him coffee, coffee and kicked him <laughs> out with a flea in his ear. I love that story so much. Yeah. How about, there she is with one of her planes, right? Yeah, Josephine pilot. the pilot. This yeah, is the plane yeah. in which she flew her missions of mercy and her airborne espionage missions. So a... Josephine, was a, she was a woman of action, you know? This yeah, was a, yeah. She was a true woman of action and, you know, uh, she's a great role model for, uh, for, for, for women today in, in that sense. For sure, so brave. Great photo. A backstage photo, Josephine, the performer. Um, you know, and she also performed, bear in mind, she had her own kind of nightclub. She's, she's Josephine in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and so she didn't just perform on the stage. She also performed kind of intimately in these intimate, intimate soirees. And anybody who went to them would 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 write of or speak of the incredible effects, magical effects she had so that she could get everybody and anyone dancing. She mm -hmm. she taught Paris to party, to let down its hair and to dance. That's great. And again, and that's Josephine really kind of like late on in the war. This is now in France where she has, um, she's returned. So she, uh, this, in this performing role, she traveled right on the front line with the troops to such an extent that in the winter of 1944, she's performing all through that horrendously bitter winter in in in, mm. in france and then into germany and at one stage she's confronted well several stages she's confronted by those who were worried for her health mm. and she yeah. says you know when they say you're freezing you know, how can you do open air stage you know and she says i am a soldier too i wow. am a soldier too that was her response she was as much a fighter as anyone else on the front line in her view and yes yeah, she had several scary uh health battles that that almost killed her how about this one? Didn't and that's with um, Dumessel Guillet. The seated lady is Dumessel Guillet. Dumessel Guillet, eventually they gave Josephine a commission. So she became a lieutenant in the, the, the French Women's Air Force. And basically the idea behind that was it was kind of the official cover to recognize her espionage duties through the war. And Dumessel Guillet became a real, uh, you know, a real champion of Josephine. So after the war, it's fascinating. Josephine was put forward. She was given the, the, the French Resistance Medal in straight after the war by uh, General de Gaulle, whose picture is on the wall in the background of that photograph, mm -hmm. rightfully so. But she was also put forward for the uh, Légion d'Honneur, which is a very, very um, high valour French medal. And it took years for her to get it. <sighs> and uh, Dumas yeah. Gillet was her champion. And, she, and at one stage, she actually says in writing, is it because she's a woman? Or is it because she's a black woman that you're refusing mm. to give her this decoration that she so richly deserves? One of the real kind of heroes and champions of Je Josephine's story post-war. It actually, yeah, it actually really rankled me as I was reading that in your book, that it took so long for her to, to be distinguished. Yeah. This is a fantastic photo. This is an iconic photo of her. Yeah, it's absolutely. That's Josephine performing for the troops. And, you know, she had, th she had this ability to just give them a small slice of home 
That's mm. what she did. You know, let's be frank about it. For every every one of those moments she was on the stage, she was every one of those soldiers, sweethearts, and she knew it. Sure. And she knew it. And that's what she was there for. It's 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 fascinating. Pr prior to the actual Nazi Germany invading France, she performed for the French and British forces along the Maginot Line, the line of defences in France that was supposed to hold the forces of Nazi Germany back. And she did so with... Um, Maurice Chevalier, a very, very well-known male French yeah. musical star. Sure. And Chevalier, believing himself to be a bigger star than Josephine, said, <laughs> I will go second, you will go first. Because <laughs> in theory, the second act is the most important act. Josephine said, fine. She was so popular with the troops. She got so many encores that but by the time Chevalier got onto the stage, there was almost no time left. <laughs> I love he it. He was incandescent <laughs> with rage. And I Josephine love it. Said, well, who are we here for? Are we here for our own egos or <laughs> right. for troops? Right. Yeah. She was really stand up, you know? Yeah. Okay. That was it for the slideshow. Thank you, Damien. So how did France and America respond to Baker's heroism? She did win several awards for her espionage, but as we just said, some of them came very late after multiple attempts. What was the general consensus uh, once word started getting out of, of her role in, in saving the world? <laughs> and helping to save the world, helping essentially. Save the world. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> it's kind of split across different countries in different ways. So, um, you know, in France today, Josephine Baker is a national hero. Yes. That, that's no exaggeration. She is a recognized as a national hero, a standout national hero. Not only did she get the French Resistance Medal and then the Legion d'Honneur and the Croix de Guerre, but mm -hmm. she also recently, just, just a year or so ago, was pantheonized, elevated to the yes. French pantheon. That yes. is the highest honor the French nation can pay. There yeah. are only 86, I think, individuals in the pantheon, and there's only half a dozen women. Yeah. So, That's you know, a, an extraordinary standout honor. Incredible. Uh, yeah. The USA, when after, well, prior to the Operation Torch landings, why Josephine and Jacques Abte became spies for America is simply because with American troops about to land in North Africa, Roosevelt needed intelligence. State of the beaches, can we land armor on those beaches? The state of the defenses, the roads, the ports, everything you, you, you need to know when you're gonna land 100,000 strong force, um, thousands of miles from home. Josephine and Jack played a seminal role in providing that, to the extent that one of those uh, American spies who was kind of handling Josephine and Jack at that time, 1942, 1943, came to see Jacques and Josephine shortly before the torch landings were going to take place and said to Josephine in particular, but both of them, America will never forget what you have done for her. Mm. America will never forget. Well, um, as far as I'm aware, Josephine has not been honored or recognized in the States at all for her wartime service. Yes. It, you know, in, in a sense there, you can kind of understand why, because the story has never really been known. Um, and that is, you, it's hard to honor someone when, you know, you don't, you can't substantiate what they, what they might deserve the honors for. I mean, what, what's kind of fed into this is that just a year ago, 18 months ago, the French government, and they deserve huge credit for this, opened up a load of, of wartime espionage files. So these secret files of their, their intelligence services. And because of that, Josephine Jack Abte's role, you know, and for me, this was like, this was the, the Rubicon moment, the before and after, because those files prove absolutely black and white Josephine and Jack's role, not just for America, but also for the British, you know, that for very, from very early on in the war, Josephine was being handled by Dunderdale out of the UK. So, so that material is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. And it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt what Josephine was doing for all of the allies, not just for France. Well, to, to your point, Damien, you know, she was a national hero. She is a national hero in France and she died in 1975 and she was only pantheonized in November of 2021. Yeah. So, you know, and they already knew more than we did. Right. So yeah. I think it'll take time, but eventually it will happen for sure. Um, we will take questions for Damien in a few minutes. Please start sending them in. In the meantime, while we wait, Damien, I have another question or two of my own. What were Baker's post-war years like? How was she transformed by her involvement and experience in World War II? I mean, emotionally, psychologically. How did it change her character? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And that, that's really why I wanted to write the book in, in many ways. So Jose the war was the making of Josephine at, at, mm -hmm. as a kind of serious player on the world stage. 
you know, before the war, she was a global superstar. You could argue she was the first global superstar. Yeah. Um, and that that in itself is utterly extraordinary. In in in, in and her, her journey to make it, her struggle to make it, is 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 compelling, utterly compelling. But the war transformed Josephine. It gave her the reason to fight. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, because it, it goes to the heart of it all. So sure. when the torch landings happen, right, Josephine. But also her French and and, and 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 British colleagues are shocked to the core when they discover that the American armed forces are segregated, that mm. there are white units and black units. They can't believe it, yeah. you know. And they say to Josephine, "What are we fighting for the Nazis for if there's yeah. segregation in the states?" Yeah. And Josephine Josephine performs for the for the for the tr American troops, and she says to them afterwards, "White and black troops." She says, "Look, yes, we have a battle to fight here." We have we have a battle for equality, but we have a much greater evil to defeat to defeat first, which is Nazi Germany. Once that's done, we can turn to the battle for equality. But until then, you know, keep the faith and let's vanquish the Nazi threat. And so once that was done, and bear in mind, she remained faithful to that battle right until the end of the war, right into yes. the VE day, right into the VJ day, and even after. But once that was done, Jose Josephine had found her mojo. She'd found, and then she became this standout campaigner and figurehead for civil rights until the day she died. Thank you for that. We have a few questions coming in, Damien. Can you tell us a bit about Josephine Baker's participation in the American civil rights movement, just to the point you were making? Um, thank you, fantastic book and program. Yeah, so so post war, obviously Josephine took up the the campaign for civil rights with 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 all you know vim and vigor you could imagine. And to give you an example of how kind of well how high profile, how exalted she became, what a figurehead she became when uh, Martin Luther King gave his famous Washington speech, Josephine spoke alongside him and gave you know her own exhortation, and she mm. used. It's fascinating. If you listen to the speech and you can, you can find it on YouTube. She used her war experience to kind of substantiate and demonstrate not just her own credibility as a campaigner, but what they were fighting for still in America. Hmm. And, you know, really fascinating. Look at the photographs of Josephine at that at that um, event. She's wearing you know, I mentioned became a, a lieutenant in the, in the Women's Air Force. She's mm. wearing that uniform and all her decorations. The war mm. bequeathed her that platform to fight for civil rights. And as I say, she be, she she remained a campaigner to the end of her days. But after Martin Luther King's assassination, Martin Luther King's widow invited Josephine to actually become the leader of the civil rights movement in the States. Mm. And she thought mm. long and hard about that. Um, and, and was hugely tempted and she actually turned it down and she turned it down because she had always wanted to be a mother she'd mm. lost the ability to be a mother because of the 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 illnesses she was plagued by during the war because right. the, the espionage role took it out of her so so badly okay sure, and so sure. she could never have children so she adopted over a dozen children and those children she made the decision had to be her kind of number one priority in the world. And if she had become a, the leader of the civil rights movement in the States, she would have just had no time for them. Sure, of course. Uh, another question. <clears throat> Did Josephine also have relationships with Marie Chevalier and Colette? Yeah, so Josephine, um, you know, the reports are that she and Maurice Chevalier had had a fling. Um, I, I'm not so sure about the Colette um, story. I don't know if that's true or not. You know, Josephine was a lover as well as a fighter. You know, we, mm -hmm. we've talked about how, and the fascinating thing about it is, it didn't get in the way of what she did best. You know, that's why Josephine and Jack Abte's story is so iconic and so um, fascinating and fabulous. You know, Jack Abte is married when war breaks out. Josephine Baker is married when war breaks out. But very quickly, they fall in love. And very quickly, they become lovers and they are lovers right through the war across across France, across, you know, the North African continent, back into France. But it never once gets in the way of their espionage duties. In fact, you could argue that kind of closeness it bequeathed and made them better as this kind of spying duo. And that's really a theme throughout Josephine's you know life. She had many lovers, was married many times, of course, married after the war, um, you know. 
in many ways regretted that she never married Jacques Abte. She once hmm. described him of the, as, as the real love of her life. Right. But, yeah. but they, they, those relationships never got in the way of her role as a performer or, or to the extent that it, that, that it was, did, had a deleterious effect or indeed her role as, as, as a spy during the war. What became of, uh, of her chateau, Damien? Yeah, so after the war, Josephine turned her chateau in one into a home for um, her, her, her many adopted children, but also she turned it into this kind of showcase for um, international relations and, yeah. and, and civil liberties. Um, and eventually she ran out of money. She became bankrupt. And I mean, partly what a bankrupt did her, I have to say, was the war years, because Again, it's fast. She, she refused to ever be paid. That contract I mentioned that the American military offered to her to perform for the rest of the war, highly lucrative. She just refused. She said, I will never get paid for what I do during the war. I, it has to be on a voluntary basis. And not only that, she used up most of her fortune in funding her, her espionage work and, and aid work during the war. And so eventually she went bankrupt and the chateau was repossessed. But the, the beauty of the story is the chateau was eventually bought by Angelique de Saint-Exupéry, this fr this wonderful French lady who bought the chateau with the intention to turn it into a living memorial to Josephine Baker's life and work, and that's exactly Fantastic. what she has done. And I urge any of you who are listening, if you ever get a chance to go and visit Chateau de Boulogne, please go. It's absolutely unmissable. A, a fitting uh, monument to a really remarkable person. Um, Damien, what are you working on next? Um, I am at the moment uh, writing another World War II book, um, and it's it's again it's a tale of um, you know a small group of individuals doing doing daring work on the front line of operations. But you know, um, writing Josephine's story was um, an incredible journey, an incredible roller coaster ride, and there's just something in me thinks I will be drawn back to that story. I don't know in what what guys. Uh, but but I, I just feel I need to return to it at some stage and, and keep getting it out there to a wider audience. I personally believe it's a very important story for today and Absolutely. that we all need to realise that the freedoms they fought for and some gave all for in World War II, we still need to fight for today. Those freedoms we still need to fight for and cherish today. In fact, we need to fight for them and be willing to fight for them every day. You said it. You said it. And I think that, you know, the fact that Election Day is in a few days in the United States is not lost on any of us. <laughs> Thank you for for bringing this up. The book is Agent Josephine, <clears throat> American Beauty, French Hero, British Spy. The author is Damien Lewis. Please check it out. If you want to learn more about Damien Lewis, it's DamienLewis.com. Damien, thank you so much for this talk. It's been incredibly, um, incredibly revelatory. And, and very, very, very vital. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good, safe weekend. Thank you. Brilliant.